my early 20s, I spent more nights than I actually really want to be admitting to you all right now, staring at a pregnancy test. Deep down, I knew the results would be negative, since I was a virgin. <laughs> But seeing those results was the only way that I could stop the nightmares that my sexual sins were going to be found out and punished, even if I wasn't having sex itself. I remember telling my friends that I was scared that something might actually be really wrong with me, and them being like, yeah. <laughs> I had left my conservative Christian community, so why was its shame and judgment still in my body? I remember feeling really scared and alone, and eventually I... called up the women that I grew up with in my church, and I told them what I was experiencing, and my jaw dropped when they said that they were experiencing some of the exact same things. So I went back to my Midwestern hometown, I dug up my old church directory, and I spent a year interviewing every woman I could find who grew up with me in my church, And over and again, I heard stories of sexual shame and anxiety and fear that echoed my own. This became the first of 16 years of working with survivors of purity culture, a global movement born out of the white American evangelical Christian church in the 1990s that shaped the sexual development of literally hundreds of millions of adolescents with its message that people, and in particular, women and girls, could be defined as either pure or impure based on our sexuality. Of course, evangelicals were not the first. <laughs> and are not the only ones to sexually shame women and girls. Shaming is baked into almost every fundamentalist expression of religion. Instead of the word purity, the word that Mormons use is worthiness. Among Muslims, the word is honor. Even in secular culture, when you hear a grown woman described as either a good girl or a bad girl, you know what that means. And it is not how much she volunteers. But purity culture managed to do something new. It made so-called purity almost cool. <laughs> My girlfriends wore purity rings alongside celebrities like Miley Cyrus, Selena Gomez, and all three Jonas Brothers. But while adolescents around the world received a dose of purity culture's toxic teachings, those of us who were raised in evangelical churches, we swallowed whole bottles of the stuff. As girls and women in particular, we learned that even our sexual thoughts or our sexual feelings could decrease our purity, which meant our worth. And so could the sexual thoughts and feelings that men had about us, as we were assumed to have inspired them. My friend Nia told me about a time in seventh grade when her girls group leader brought a pan of freshly baked brownies to her Bible study. Who wants a brownie? The leader asked. All the girls raised their hand. I can't wait to give one to you, she said. I just need to do one thing first. The leader then invited Nia and the other girls to follow her outside where she dragged a knife through a pile of dog poop. Hang on. <laughs> she brought the knife inside and proceeded to cut the brownies with the knife. Who wants a brownie? No one raised their hand. Right, she said. You may think that masturbation or making out with your boyfriend is no big deal, but all it takes is a hint of dog poop to make these brownies impure, just like all it takes is a hint of sexual immorality to make yourself impure. And once you're impure, no one will want you. Growing up with messages like these, a lot of us developed the kind of deep, and long-lasting shame and anxiety that we would later identify as post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. Take Becca, a dietitian who followed all the rules, including waiting until marriage to have sex. 
She had been promised that on her wedding day, she would be able to turn her sexuality on like a light switch. Four years into her marriage, the shame-induced pain still makes sex impossible. Or Eli, a pansexual, non-binary teacher, so ashamed of even being attracted to somebody, let alone somebody of a different gender than they were raised to be, that they're literally paralyzed, unable even to flirt. Or Stella, a nurse who actually can physically have sex before marriage, but not be mentally present for it. When she forced herself to come into her body, she almost had a panic attack. I have heard countless stories of sexual trauma and dysfunction among people who were raised as girls in purity culture. But the more that I listened, the more I started to understand that this is just the beginning of the story. Sexual dysfunction is the presenting symptom, but it reveals a deeper problem. Purity culture conditioned girls and women to suppress our feelings, our intuitions, and our bodies to distrust our own thoughts and to hand over our choices in every area of our lives, not only our sexuality. For example, we were taught to stop a thought if it conflicted with that of a leader or to shut down feelings that we weren't supposed to be having, like anger, <laughs> or even too much happiness, which we learned could be a sign of selfishness. This isn't just heartbreaking, it's actually really dangerous. Our bodies, our intuitions, and our feelings, they protect us. And when we suppress them, we often have no way to sense danger, making us vulnerable to sexual assault, intimate partner violence, and other threats. Suppressing yourself can even kill you, literally. When I was a senior in high school, I started to have a lot of stomach pains, and I was losing a lot of blood. One of the first doctors that I saw told me that if my symptoms were as severe as I claimed they were, I wouldn't be smiling so much. So... I did what I had learned to do best. I told my body and my feelings to shut up, sit down, and behave. By my first year of college, I was taking five ibuprofen at a time just to get through class, which, by the way, is very dangerous, so don't do that. <laughs> and eventually, things got so bad that a friend took me to the emergency room, and before long, I was rushed into surgery. My doctor diagnosed me with Crohn's disease. He said, it never should have gotten so out of control as to have become life-threatening. But it had. Even still, while I was in the hospital, I was admonished for not suppressing my pain, a family member accusing me of exaggerating it for attention. When I recovered from my fourth surgery a year and a half later, I remember being done playing by purity culture's rules. I even told my long-term boyfriend I might be willing to have sex before marriage. <laughs> Not that that happened, right? Because just the thought of it triggered my sexual shame and led to my rather unhealthy relationship with pregnancy tests. <laughs> it has taken me years to be able to value and to listen to and to trust myself enough to be able to override others' expectations. And some days I'm still better at it than others. But against the odds, I've been able to create a life of my own making. Four years after publishing a book on purity culture, I now run my own not-for-profit and work one-on-one -on -one with purity culture survivors to reclaim our lives. I met Lily, an artist who was raised by a conservative Christian family during the pandemic. Like a lot of folks, she spent most of 2020 alone, which for her meant reading lots of books like Pleasure Activism and Letters from the War Zone. Every time the author said something that Lily had been raised to disagree with, she instinctively felt like she was supposed to slam the book shut. 
But she decided that she was going to hear them out and was surprised to find that she actually agreed with a lot of what they had to say. Then Lily started to ask herself a question. If I can hear them out, why can't I hear myself out? She started to make a concerted effort to stop shutting down the thoughts, feelings, and desires that she had learned were wrong and to actually ask herself, what do I think? (laughs) What do I feel? What do I want? Which is when Lily realized that she was bisexual. Before long, she started her first real relationship with a woman and she was giddy in love. She wanted to tell her family about it because she wanted to bring them into more intimacy in her life, but she knew that they would not approve. So Lily and I worked together to help her to be able to come out to her family in a way that felt really good to her. Still, she was nervous when she was going home for the holidays afterward. Lily decided she was gonna act normal. She talked about her girlfriend the way she would any other relationship. She laughed. her big signature laugh with her brother and his girlfriend, both of whom were affirming. And she noticed other family members looking on with confusion. They expected her to be ashamed. After all, Lily was impure. She wasn't supposed to be happy. But in that moment, she realized that's exactly what she was. She was happy. For the first time, it didn't matter what anyone else thought. Lily was living her own life. What that looks like is different for every person. For example, some purity culture survivors will never touch religion or spirituality again, while others reconstruct their faith on their own terms. As for me, I no longer attend church but I do still believe in something greater than myself. And the one time in my life that it spoke to me, it turned everything I learned in purity culture on its head. Was it the voice of God? I think so, but I'm gonna let you all decide for yourselves. Here's what it said. The greatest gift I have ever given you is the gift of choice. When you make choices based on what you fear others will think, you give my gift to them. It's not for them. It is for you. Whether we were raised in evangelicalism or Islam or Orthodox Judaism or Catholicism or just the world, So many of us have shaped our lives around what others have wanted for and from us. But I'm here to tell you that when you begin to claim who you really are and to make choices out of that place, it changes everything. I am taking back my gift of choice. So are Becca, Eli, Stella, Lily, Nia, and countless others. And it feels really good. Thank you.